What's up, everybody? It's Alex from Heavy New York. We are back at the Gramercy Theater. It's been quite a minute since we've been here, and today we are here with Ben of Orange Goblin. Thank you for being here today. No ben. problem at all. Nice to uh, be here back in New York City after how many years? Four or five years since uh, since we played here. So five, I think. So, yeah, it's good to be back. It's awesome to have you back here. I know there was a little trouble, you know, uh, before the tour, but I'm glad you guys pushed through and were able to carry on with everything. Yeah, I mean, this, at this point last week, it didn't look as if it was going to happen. Um, we had some administration issues with Chris's visa that um, we couldn't really uh, do much about. Um, it's no one's fault, really. There's, there's nobody we can sort of pinpoint as the, uh, as the blame for it all. It's just one of those things that happens. Um, and uh, fortunately, we got in touch with... Uh, friends over here that were helping us out with the backline and guys from the skull and they suggested that we contact this guy Chad that's uh stepped up to the plate he uh he didn't start learning the set till last Wednesday here we are Tuesday night uh we've had one rehearsal with him yesterday in a New York rehearsal room and he's smashing it to be honest it's uh it's incredible how much he sort of learned and fortunately for us and and the, the fans that the show goes on tonight so here we are can't kill this genre, or nothing can stop us. No, that's it. Uh, I mean, over the course of our 25-year history, I think we've always sort of had to face adversity in different situations, whether it's sort of self-imposed or, or the authorities that have kind of caused us issues. But uh, we always seem to kind of land on our feet. And uh, <clears throat> it's testament to the sort of uh, the dedication that we have to the band and the, um, the professionalism that we kind of deny that we have a lot of the time we kind of we're very self-deprecating we we don't sort of give ourselves the credit i think we deserve sometimes and the fact that you know martin joe and i have flown over here without chris it would have been easy for us to just sort of throw the towel in and say no nah, do you know what if chris isn't coming but there was too much on the line and it's not just from a financial standpoint it's the it's the people you know the fans that have bought tickets it's the agent that spent months or years organizing this tour and and uh, we didn't want to let anybody down, so we've had to dig deep in our own kind of uh, efforts to, to get ourselves over here and put on the best show we possibly can for the people that have obviously gone out and bought the tickets and things like that. So. Now, being that The Wolf Bites Back is still your latest record, uh, it's about a year old. What I was curious is, being that The Wolf Bites Back was the first record since Back From The Abyss, yeah. uh, which was uh, four years before that, was this like a fresh start or a similar approach as opposed to Back From The Abyss or a eulogy for The Damned or any of those I records? I think it's always been a similar approach when it comes to songwriting and uh, recording albums. Nothing's ever changed. We've never been one of those bands that wanted to fall into that cycle of um, having to feel that kind of label pressure to record a certain time and then go out and spend two years on the road uh, promoting the album. We've always wanted to do things in our own time because I don't think you can achieve the best results when you're under scrutiny and under pressure to deliver something at a certain time. Um, it kind of seems a bit forced. So we always like to kind of wait until we're ready, know we have the material, uh, the best that we possibly feel it could be. And that didn't change. There was a five-year gap between Back From The Abyss and The Wolf Bites Back, but that was purely because circumstances changed. When we recorded Back From The Abyss, we was doing the band for a living and we'd spent a long time on the road in 2013, 2014, and we realised that, unfortunately, this style of music doesn't earn, in us, earn us enough to pay the bills. So we all had to go back to day jobs, and obviously that dictated that we didn't get enough time sort of in the studio and rehearsing as much as we did previously. And our personal situations changed. Like we all went through relationship changes and things like that. So that kind of uh, put a halt on the band being our priority. It was, you know, it's always been like a at the forefront of our thoughts, but it's always been more of a hobby than anything until until 2013 when we did it full time for the first time in our career. So yeah, there was no kind of uh, intention to leave it that long between albums. It just it was nature took its God, and we weren't lazy. We weren't like not doing anything. We was uh, touring as much as we possibly could. We was doing a lot of shows in Europe at festivals during the summer, and spending all of our weekends going away to foreign countries and doing the bits that we could. So um, the Wolf Pipes Back was, hence the title, it was kind of a statement of you know like we haven't gone anywhere. We're still here, and we felt that we were, if anything, more relevant than we'd ever been. Um, maybe born out of a little bit of frustration that we'd never kind of taken that next step, maybe born out of frustration that there's kind of a, 
a diluted kind of scene where there's a lot of bands springing up from all over the place that I didn't feel kind of necessarily understood where we'd come from 25 years ago when it wasn't about just sort of writing and recording a few songs on your iPhone and stinging them up onto a band camp or SoundCloud or something like that. We, we had to work hard. It was a case of like, you know, paying to go into a studio, record a demo on a tape, go and handing out flyers at shows, doing everything via tape trading and sending demos to fanzines and things like that. And you had to kind of earn your peers' respect. And I felt that we did a lot of that in the early days. So, um, yeah, but like I said, it was probably a bit of frustration that these days a lot of bands kind of expect to have things handed to them on a silver platter and it's it's not how it works you yeah. you have to uh, you have to work hard and you have to stick with it you still got to go to the grocery store exactly you got to be prepared to jump in the van and do those tours around all the fucking dive bars and all the shitty little venues where there's no rider and there's no bathroom you can use it's, it's a it's a well like ACDC said it's a long way to the top <laughs> so of course of course <laughs> You know, in the early days, if you, if you, if the if the club has a PA system, then it's king. Yeah, I mean, I remember in the early days we used to turn up at shows. And we didn't know how things worked. I didn't know what a sort of PA was. I didn't know what monitors were, and it was a it was a learning curve from day one. So, um, yeah, it's been a it's been a long time coming for a band like us to be headlining, you know, venues like the Gramercy Theatre in New York City. It's it's a it's a real honour for us and. We're going to enjoy it. And uh, again, it's like that's one of the reasons we didn't want to sort of lose this tour is because we realise how hard we've worked to get here. And, yeah. you know, we could have not done it and people may have forgotten about us. And further down the line, so, you know, fuck those guys. They didn't turn up. They, they didn't uh, honour the tickets that were bought and things like that. So here we are. Yeah. A lot of people are, when they found out about like the recent news, people were like, I've got to get to the show tonight. Like, so. Yeah. I mean, I know it's it's difficult for Chris, and he's understandably really disappointed, as we all are, because you know this band is not about any particular individual. There's four parts that make this band, and missing Chris is a real big wrench on all of us because he's an integral part of that machine. But you know, is uh, we had to do it. We we just had to be here, and we're we're going to go out there and do the best shows that we possibly can. For you, like, is there ever a time, because you mentioned, like, The Wolf Bites Back, there was a lot of, you know, stuff in your personal lives that maybe helped influence, like, the sound of the record, the lyrics and stuff. Do you guys sometimes think of a concept and write music according to that, or does music need to be laid down first before lyrics and a subject matter is even thought of? I think sometimes it's a little bit subconscious. You don't necessarily kind of go out of your way to specifically write something, but if you're angry about something, then it kind of comes through in the music anyway without specifically realizing it um as far as the process goes i mean martin joe and chris they come up with the bulk of the music between them and then my kind of lyrics are influenced by the sound of what they come up with meets what i've kind of been intrigued by or interested in recently whether it's movies or books or I don't know, something that I just kind of think that would make a kind of interesting story to tell in the in a in a lyric. So um yeah, I kind of rely on what they come up with first to dictate how I'm gonna respond. And they don't really know what I'm gonna come up with until we get to the studio. We spend a lot of time kind of honing the songs and fine tuning everything in the studio before we go to record, but ninety percent of the material, they don't have a clue what the vocal's gonna be, what the lyrics are gonna be about, what the song's even gonna be called. So it's it's kind of a, it's an interesting procedure. It's and organic. Yeah, and that goes back to what I was saying. I don't think music should be forced. It should be something that feels natural. So that's why I like to wait until they've done their bit. So it kind of leads me to something that will suit the mood of the music. Or, and on the previous album, you've got songs like The Stranger, which is that kind of, I mean, it shouldn't work, that song. It's, it's almost like um, Southern rock meets prog. And it's, it's so far out there. And that's why... I thought I'd had this crazy idea about this song and the, the concept of this uh, sort of thing that doesn't know if he's human, doesn't know whether he's alien. It's uh, like a serial killer in a in a stranger's body, and and I thought, well, that music because it don't sort of fit, it kind of matches the idea that I had for the stranger. So put them together, and it's, it kind of works. Very good. It sounds like you have a very organic process behind writing music. 
Yeah, I think that's the way it should be. And nothing's ever off limits for Orange Goblin. We've never sort of said that we're specifically a stoner rock band or a doom metal band or, or anything in particular. If there's something that we like and we think it works, we'll go with it. It's, uh, it's what music's about. It's about being creative and doing what you want to hear. It's, I mean, the reason we formed Orange Goblin is because there wasn't an Orange Goblin in the world. It's that like we all love Led Zeppelin, we love Black Sabbath, we love Motorhead, we love Pink Floyd, we love all those sort of different influences, but there wasn't one band that kind of com com combined them all and made the perfect blend of everything that we was into. So that's hopefully, like we've always said, we've kind of ripped off so many bands, we've created something quite unique. <laughs> exactly. They always say artists are professional thieves. That's yeah. and it's, it's how well you uh, manage to get away with it. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, I have two more questions for you. Um, one thing I'm curious about is this is my first time seeing Orange Goblin yeah. tonight. Um, when you're playing live, do you try to execute the material exactly how it sounds on the album? Or is it like a completely different energy or a completely different vibe playing on a stage versus like in the studio or a practice space? It's a, it's a really um, suitable question for this sort of era in our career. Because in the past, I think we've always kind of considered ourselves more of a live band and I think people have always enjoyed us more in a live environment than on record we've never kind of been able to capture that energy and that enthusiasm in the studio that we have on stage but with the wolf bites back we kind of set out to capture that a little bit more and in the past we might have been guilty of overemphasizing sort of guitar tracks and putting keyboards in places and having elements of songs that you can't replicate on stage in a live environment especially when there's only four of you in the band so this time we kind of went went into the studio thinking we don't want to sort of over egg it and not have stuff that we can't pull off on stage so it's like everything can be delivered live and um i think that's what gives that album that more organic um spontaneous kind of feel so it's uh it's what we're going to kind of aim for in the future i think you know, I've, I've had a discussion about this with some fellow metalhead peers of mine, and they say that sometimes when they hear, like, an artist even slightly botch a note or slightly yeah. go off time or key or something like that, they almost kind of like it because it adds to, I guess, the realness of the artist. Yeah, I think it shows, you know, that, that natural kind of, uh, I suppose talent isn't a word, but it kind of is because, you know, if you, if you kind of overdub everything and try and correct every little missed note or anything it kind of shows some kind of um fault or some sort of uh shame in making a mistake and and not doing it uh as you would normally so we've never been afraid of you know making mistakes we, when we did the live album in 2012 um we was asked if we wanted to go back in the studio and sort of re redo some over uh, guitar overdubs or vocal overdubs it's like no if that's how it sounded on stage that night that's what we should put out. So you get that feeling of being there rather than it being contrived and, and not, you know, honest. Mm -hmm. And I, I always prefer live albums that have that honesty and, and bands that have that honesty. And that's why the best live albums are like, you know, No Sleep Till Hammersmith or Live and Dangerous by Thin Lizzy. And, you know, you could go on all day with these bands that never kind of gave too much of a shit about making it sound absolutely no perfect on the night because it's it's like, that. this is us, this is how we are. and. And I, I kind of think fans appreciate that and it gives them more of an affinity with the band and that kind of I was there sort of vibe. Of course, of course. And the final question I'd like to ask you is my favorite question to ask yeah. every artist because it's always the hardest question for them to answer. And being that your songs have many different song lengths, it's the perfect question to ask you. How do you know when a song is done? Um, I don't know whether you mean like in a live environment or in the studio. Uh, 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 well, for me, being a vocalist, um, it's kind of, you know, I, I've run out of things to say. <laughs> I know I've, I've finished all the words I have to sing. But in the studio, I think we're, we're quite good at knowing when to cut a song off and not over-egg it. I think sometimes bands are, very, are guilty of thinking, oh, let's add another bit, let's add another bit. And, and it ends up losing its kind of general initial vibe. And particularly in like stoner rock or doom metal where there's a tendency to play a riff for 25 minutes without changing it. <laughs> so yeah, I think we've got quite good at, you know, knowing exactly how long to play a certain thing in a certain song and knowing when to cut it and uh, 
move on to something else because I don't know I, I think it's probably a, a sign of the times that we live in I don't think people have the attention span anymore I don't think kids these days would be going out buying Emerson Lake and Palmer albums and you know yes albums with sort of 37 minute songs on <laughs> my friend was a uh, 40 he said he was 40 minutes late to see dream theater and he made it before they got to the first chorus so. yeah i mean that don't surprise me so yeah the people's attention span you need they want something short sharp and grab their attention and uh especially in this age where people are streaming music and downloading music they haven't got time to sit around to listen to a 10 track album so that's why a lot of bands nowadays they focus on delivering sort of an ep or a single and and dwell on that so yeah, it's a, it's, things have changed, it's like, you know, and, and I think as we've grown older, maybe we've grown wiser, I don't know, that's debatable, but I think we've kind of always been a little bit reluctant to over-egg it and, and make a song drag on for too long. We was guilty of it in the early days, don't get me wrong, but these days I think the longest song on the album is The Stranger, about seven or eight minutes, yeah. and that's only because it was like two songs put into one. So. There you go. <laughs> So before we go, I'd like to thank you so much for your yeah, time today. You yep, it's going to be a great show tonight. Is there just anything else with Orange Goblin you would like to promote in terms of other tours coming up or some new music? Can we be expecting some new music? There's no real sort of plans for new music. Um, we finished our record deal with Candlelight and Spine Farm with the delivery of Wolf Bites Back. Um, so, you know, we're talking to a few different labels. We're con contemplating doing some stuff ourselves. There's... There's no real rush, you know, 25 years into a career and nine studio albums, a live album. We've got plenty of material to keep us going in a live environment. So we'll uh, we'll see what next year brings. This year, obviously, we've got these US dates. Then we go to Greece. Uh, got a couple of shows in the UK before the end of the year. And we're just starting to look at the diary for next year because it's the 25-year anniversary of the band next year. We want to make everything we do a little bit special and uh, pick and choose where we play carefully. So. You guys have been around as long as I've been alive. Yeah. Oh, now I feel old. <laughs> <laughs> as I do with everybody. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Of course. Nice everybody, we are here with men of Orange Goblin. The Wolf Bites Back. Pick that up if you haven't already. This is Alex from Heavy New York. We'll see you next time.